Um, but if you have questions about a particular issue that I don't mention, and, and because Cole didn't really want me to do a policy speech, which I'm glad not to do, but two things that uh, you know have caught my eye in the last couple of days, just uh, you know looking at my phone and what pops up in the news feed, the uh, the death in Syria of Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, is very interesting to me, and it's it's uh, you know predictable that. Trump would gloat about that, but that's no different. Hillary Clinton gloated about killing Gaddafi, and Obama gloated about killing bin, uh, bin Laden, and Bush gloated about capturing Saddam Hussein. And I would guess that most people in this country, but also in the Middle East and around the world, probably think, well, good for you. That's what you're supposed to do is get the bad guys, right? And maybe this is a good example of U.S. intelligence doing you know, what they're supposed to do in special forces. But I hope there's at least some of us that help to uh, add a, a needed corrective. Uh, and I'm not spilling any tears for the death of the head of ISIS, but uh, there wouldn't have been an ISIS if the United States hadn't overthrown the government of Iraq and created instability in the region and in Syria and armed Saudi Arabia, etc. So, you know, we do have to look at the sort of self perpetuating and really ultimately self-defeating for those of us that care about more life-affirming priorities, nature of the so-called war on terror. It only works if you can play whack-a-mole with terrorists but create more and more terrorists all the time, which is certainly what the United States and our allies have done. So I'll be very interested to see, and if there isn't much of that sort of broader context, then some of us may be uh, uh, inspired to write op-eds in that vein that, okay, they got one of the bad guys here, but where did he come from? And the groundwork was laid for ISIS and their horrors in the region. By whom? By our imperial uh, hubris and our, and our you know, murder of uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of people that didn't deserve it in the region. The other thing that I took note of, and uh, one of the things that I try to do in analyzing the news, and I hope you all do as well, is looking at official government statements and then sort of trying if there is a way to confirm from other things you hear or you know from your your gut um, sentence uh, your, your gut sense of does this make sense or not and uh, you know one of the, the the two words that I think are the most important words to remember uh, from IF Stone the great investigative journalist is government's lie that's the two words that he always <laughs> proceeded with but sometimes, beside themselves, they may inadvertently tell the truth, or they may tell the truth for an interest that you may not agree with, but as long as you understand what that interest is, you might learn something. And uh, what North Korea has been saying in the last uh, period, but particularly even in the last couple of days, that they are very serious about a deadline as of the end of this year to see some real concrete progress uh, with negotiations uh, you know, with the United States. And for me, and I'm not usually someone privy to a lot of inside information just because I live in Rome on the Potomac, um, there, there, there are people that I know who know North Korean diplomats who confirm sort of privately behind the scenes that what they are saying publicly they are serious about. North Korea is serious about wanting some sort of interim deal by the end of this year. And if they don't get it, who knows where we could be. Now there is maybe some bluster about, I think today there, one of the officials was saying uh, we could return to live fire at any time or something like that. He didn't say fire and fury because I guess he didn't want to be copying Trump. Uh, but it could be very dangerous and you could be looking at an escalation. And for a lot of the difficulties that we've had with uh, pushing, for example, HRES 152, the Kana bill, a lot of partisan democratic opposition, including from the top, from Pelosi and Hoyer and others, who don't want to see Trump have a diplomatic victory, which is entirely cynical to me because they are putting their partisan political interests above the interests of the 80 million people that live in the two Koreas, but also in the region. Uh, but you know that is a real factor that we have to deal with. And so the fact that Massachusetts has one of the better congressional delegations, and I think only McGovern is the only co-sponsor of HRS 152, and we only have 40. We only have 40 co-sponsors. That's less than one-tenth of, of the, the House. Uh, however, the language uh, in favor of a peace agreement with North Korea has survived so far in the awful sausage-making of the National Defense Authorization 
Act or the International Instability Act or whatever you want to call it. Um, so far, the language of the kind of bill or, or similar to the kind of bill of promoting, uh, you know, peace agreement with North Korea has uh, is still alive, and that that and a number of other provisions on war powers on Iran on Yemen, on nuclear weapons, on Seoul Authority, etc. All those things we're going to have to ride herd on in the horrible, horrible sausage making that's even worse than usual right now in Washington. And it's not even clear that they will have a defense authorization bill anytime soon. Um, the fact that the government will run out of money November 21st and how they deal with that and then the NDA is being held up because of the stupidity of the wall and just all these things that give me a headache to even try to explain to you. Uh, but I do think that North Korea is very serious, and apart from the very cynical partisan opposition of a lot of Democrats, and not all, right, there are some good Democratic folks that are on there, and this bill, which we were actually consulted in and helped to write uh, uh, with uh, uh, Representative Khanna's staff, was meant to be a nonpartisan uh, bill, and there were a few Republicans that were approached, but n none have signed on yet. Despite all that, and that's just a difficult, frustrating political reality we have to deal with, there are legitimate criticisms of the Trump administration, and particularly their rigidity regarding Korea, Partly, uh, especially on you know, the, the last summit at Hanoi. There was a really good, solid deal on offer from North Korea, and the United States couldn't say yes. And a lot of people attributed that to John Bolton coming in and throwing a grenade and blowing up the talks at the end, which I think he does deserve some of the blame for that. But for the United States to continue on this rigid stance that you know before you can get any kind of sanctions relief, you have to completely denuclearize, that's just fantasy land. That's not going to happen. Why in the world would North Korea ever agree to that? And while I don't try to put myself in the position of the North Korean government, it is entirely logical that they're uh, feeling the need to develop nuclear weapons for their security uh, came at a great cost, but it could be that their most valuable asset or, or most valuable, that they are most valuable as an asset to trade away at this point. That is entirely logical that it could be if North Korea gets the security guarantees they need, the sanctions relief they need, etc. Uh, so I do think by the end of this year it is possible, but my concern is, is there anybody home in the government, in the Trump administration, Pompeo, in the State Department, is there anybody in that gang that's not just completely consumed with their political survival right now, as they ought to be with the impeachment inquiry bearing down on them. So this is something that's going to be you know, very important for us to watch. So again, I'm not going to try to get into where we are in Yemen and nukes and Pentagon budget and all that stuff, but we certainly can talk about any of those issues uh, that you find to be particularly uh, urgent. So Cole wanted me to talk a little bit about kind of the, the picture of the, the, the peace movement uh, writ large, and I'm very blessed and honored both in my national role, but also some of the international networks that I'm part of along with Joseph and others uh, to gain uh, inspiration and wisdom from you know, international movements for peace and disarmament and social justice. And one of the things that I think about darn near every day uh, are the giant triplets or the triple evils enunciated by Dr. King in 1967, and he repeated them many times, but racism, militarism, and economic exploitation. And I'm not usually pedantic about word choice, but the third one, sometimes people say poverty. I don't say poverty, and King usually didn't say poverty either. He usually said extreme materialism or economic exploitation. And I think either of those terms is better than poverty. To me, poverty connotes for people, and it sort of lets people off the hook, that poverty is this amorphous force of nature that's always existed. Well, I don't think that's true. I think it exists because of extreme materialism and economic exploitation. Economic exploitation is what capitalism is about. Somebody is exploiting somebody else. And certainly in this world and in this country that has the most obscene income inequality that we've ever seen, at least since the 1920s, that's very apparent to anyone that's paying attention. And particularly to young people, uh, you know, I have a 21-year-old and a 25-year-old, and I, I fear so much for their future economically. And uh, uh, a friend of mine and I, one time we were talking about, you know, we don't understand how young people aren't out in the streets with pitchforks. And then the rejoinder to that was, well, in this economy, who can afford a pitchfork? Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's, you know, that is the, the, the grim economic reality in the future. Uh, particularly for, for young people, and I think that's why it's so important that some of the movements now are being led by young people, as has always been the case. 
Uh, if you look back at people's social movements the world over, it's always young people who are leading them. So among the, the giant triplets or the, or the triple evils, uh, I don't know that anyone has tried to do any kind of an objective uh, evaluation of these, and I, and I certainly would be interesting for me to do, although I haven't spent the time to do it, but of racism, militarism, and economic exploitation, or extreme materialism, however you want to uh, uh, describe the third one, it, it's, it's very possible that the one of the three that people in this country are most in denial about is our level of militarism. I'm not saying it's worse, okay? Not saying it's worse. I'm going to say that for the third time because people always misquote me. I'm not saying it's worse. As a white male, I have no right to say that it's worse, okay? That militarism is worse than racism or economic exploitation. What did I say, Cole? Did I say it's worse? I did not <laughs> say that it's worse. And I'm, I'm deliberately hammering this out because people misquote me all the time. Um, I think it's the one that perhaps we're most in denial about. And I think it's gotten much worse since 9-11. Not that it was great before. And I think if King were alive or if somebody were to try to do you know, a side-by-side -side comparison of where were we on those giant triplets then and where are we now, and of course the Poor People's Campaign has revived that framework and is working on that, and they may actually, I've read some of their stuff, but I haven't read a lot of their analytical stuff, so they may be doing a comparison. And so on militarism, you know, it, it would be a disservice, particularly to the people of Vietnam, who we slaughtered three to four million of, to say that it's worse now than it was then. But I think you might be able to say, as a social structure that's embedded in our society and is unquestioned, that maybe it is worse now than it was then. And of course, the movement we had then was much bigger. And uh, the sister who earlier talked about the differences in movements, maybe we'll get to this later, maybe we won't. But I do think there is a difference between talking about peace movements and anti-war movements. Uh, peace movements over time are usually small and weak. Anti-war movements bubble up when there are horrors like the Vietnam War or like what the U.S. was doing in Central America or like the Iraq War. And then more people get into a movement mode, and movement is the right word, or the French word manifestation, manifestation, right? You, you are, your people are moving, they're in motion, or you're manifesting, or you're demonstrating your power. And that's always bigger in an anti-war movement than an ongoing peace movement. I think that is true, certainly going back to uh, at least Vietnam, but we could maybe talk about that later if we wanted to. Now, when I look at this, I'm inspired by the Poor People's Campaign. Now, I know some people, and I, I've listened very carefully about this, have some concerns about their organizing model, state by state and in the capital of the state. And for some activists that I know and respect a lot, it just doesn't work in their state. The capital is some small city in the middle of the state. It's not the big population center. And it can be difficult to get folks mobilized to do that. So I, I want to honor that at the same time that I want to honor what the Poor People's Campaign is doing in working to build a multiracial, multiclass, multigenerational movement. And again, linking you know, those three triple evils. And of course, bringing in climate change as well, and to me that fits in the third one, or however you want to fit it, doesn't matter all that much to me. It's certainly part of that agenda. And I can't decide whether it's depressing or inspiring that we're still doing this. There, there, uh, sometimes, sometimes at protests there are people with signs that say, I can't believe I still have to protest this shit. You know, so I, I sometimes feel like that. Is it depressing that we're still looking at the triple evils? You know, 1967 was a long time ago. I was five years old at the time, right? Um, but I don't know. Maybe it is inspiring that people still see that that framework is something that we have to work on. So I think some of the, the strength that I see at the peace movement on the one hand, for a national organization that works on uh, legislation and elections, you know, we're, we're very focused on trying to get our supporters to focus on that. And it's not always the same orientation as grassroots activists have. And I think I have a pretty good understanding of that because I was the executive director of Illinois Peace Action for 10 years. And, uh, you know, the fact that people are doing such fantastic work on local resolutions, a la Back from the Brink. I was in Salt Lake City earlier this year. You don't think of Utah as being a bastion of liberalism. Salt Lake City is actually a fairly liberal city. And they've passed one of the best, most comprehensive resolutions in favor of the Ban Treaty and the Back from the Brink program. Uh, and now, gosh, I don't even know how many cities are there. Tim, you must know how many cities in the United States have passed it now. It's, I think it's well over 50. I mean, I think it's really growing. And then the, the legislation that you guys are working on at the State House is phenomenal. Um, so I think a lot of that work and also around divestment. So a lot of those um, campaigns that are really about building connections, building intersectional, intergenerational 
movements, making connections between uh, issues are incredibly important. And to me, they're at least as important, if not more important, than what we try to do when we are mobilizing people around the national <coughs> legislation trying to pass this bill or that bill. <coughs> to me, they're, they're you know, equally valid and important. You know, for me, which I'm just speaking for me personally, uh, I think that um, my uh, respect for that is every bit as much uh, as it is the respect for the people who work on legislation, because it's really, really hard to work on legislation, as all of you know. Uh, what I see in terms of, and again, I'm very blessed to travel not just around this country, but internationally, and uh, I, I, what I see is a lot of, of resilience and a lot of people really struggling with, with difficult issues. Um, but I, I do see that we are often spread thin. So I really appreciated the brother over here saying he was going to focus on nuclear disarmament, not to the exclusion of other things, but that if other people tell him, here's what I can do to make a difference on this or that issue, I will follow them and I will take action, but that you're personally, I'm sort of jealous, okay, that you get to do that, because I don't get to specialize in anything, unfortunately. I mean, I get to choose a few things that I focus on. Um, but so I think that's, that's an interesting challenge, because on the one hand, um, it is a broader peace and social justice movement that understands these connections and everything is connected to everything, as my uncle used to say. On the other hand, we don't have near the capacity of the resources that we used to have, even when we had a more focused, smaller agenda on peace, disarmament, anti-war. So that's, I don't, I don't lament that. I try to just see things as they are and try to figure out how we organize accordingly. So I think on the one hand, we're to be commended for how ecumenical we are in terms of really trying to connect all these things. And then I'm sure a lot of us wake up someday and like, oh, I'm not doing enough on climate change. I haven't done enough on Israel and Palestine. I haven't done enough on immigration, right? Well, we need to give ourselves a break at some point because there's only so many hours in the day and there are other things to do. Uh, but I do think that there are a lot of commonalities as I travel around and meet with local groups around the country of really trying to have an impact on lots and lots and lots of issues, which is very laudable, but with very little resources or capacity to make a huge difference on anything. And I think that's just a challenge that we struggle with, and it's sort of a common issue. Um, I want to end with uh, just one other thing that's a little bit different about peace action. And it's not actually my favorite kind of work, but it does go with sort of trying to figure out where people at in terms of how do we organize them. A lot of people in this country really don't engage with politics outside of elections. That's just the fact, unfortunately. Now, we've had a campaign called Peace Voter, which we've been doing since the mid-90s. And one of the good things about it is that we have a lot of different resources and tactics. And so even though a lot of you in here are probably with 501c3 organizations, we do have some resources that can be available to you even if you can't endorse candidates. So on our webpage, on uh, peaceaction.org, uh, right now we have uh, candidate profiles on the major presidential candidates and where they stand <coughs> on peace and disarmament, social justice issues. And we also have a policy platform, a progressive foreign policy platform. So this is all nonpartisan. It's not endorsing anybody. And you can use these to put in front of your candidates for anything. It doesn't have to just be for federal office. You could use this with state uh, house or, or, or county or, or city government or whatever you, whatever you like. And often, as we know, the people that, that go to Congress often start out in lower, not lower, but in different you know, uh, state government or local government you know, before they get to Congress. And so if you can help educate them on a better foreign policy, better uh, war and peace and, and disarmament policies, you know, that can help us in the future. Now, we do also make endorsements. Peace Action is one of the few groups that does make endorsements. So we've already endorsed uh, at least a half a dozen um, uh, for Congress, and one of the most important things we did is we endorsed uh, all four members of the squad, including Ayanna Presley, who I'm not sure did we endorse her last time. The other three we, we had. We endorsed her opponent. Okay. So no hard feelings. Yeah, no, we, we, we were wrong. We changed our minds. Well, I don't know that we were wrong. I mean, she I won the election. We, I think we were wrong. Okay. <laughs> Cole, Cole can say that. Uh, but because, because they are so under attack, and also because they are providing such incredible moral and political leadership and being all you know, younger women of color. And of the four, um, you know, we have good relations you know, with all of them. But to me, the one who that just impresses me so much is Ilhan Omar. And she is under such attack and under you know, personal threat. But she and her staff really have a comprehensive vision about what a different and more peaceful and just US foreign and military policy should look like. And this shouldn't be a surprise. She's a refugee of war from Somalia. 
Um, and, and I don't know if you saw her uh, recent stuff. Uh, she had an, an op-ed just uh, last week, I guess it was, in, in the uh, Washington Post, and she's really focusing on the harm of economic sanctions and how economic sanctions are supposed to be a tool of foreign policy, but have actually become a policy in in of themselves. Certainly, going back to Cuba and Iraq are probably the two worst over time, but with North Korea, with Iran, with Venezuela, and you know, Russia down the list. Um, so I think she's somebody that. Um, you know, really deserves a lot, a lot of support, and, and I think they're all fantastic, but the one that really stands out to me in terms of really having sort of a comprehensive view of a better foreign policy is Ilhan Omar. Uh, so we've endorsed her, and we've endorsed a few other candidates, and there's going to be a bunch of other candidates coming out very soon. And in terms of the presidential race, we're in the middle of a process right now, which I think is going to be very illuminating. Uh, we're, it's relatively rare that we endorse for president. So we didn't endorse Bernie Sanders last time in the primary, but then after he lost in the primary, we didn't endorse in the general. The last time we endorsed for president in the general was Bill Clinton in 92, which I completely disavow. I was against it at the time. I knew it was a mistake, and I didn't have anything to do with it. I was in Illinois at the time. It was also, uh, coincidentally, the last time I actually voted for a Democrat for president personally. I voted green or independent every single time since then. Um, but it's very possible that we will be making another endorsement for president uh, in the next month or so, and, and maybe even be sooner than that. And the folks here in Massachusetts have been great in terms of helping to advocate of how you know, we should do that and what we should do. So I don't have any news to break about that today, uh, but stay tuned. I think it's entirely likely that the National Board of Peace Action will make an endorsement for president uh, probably by the end of November. Um, so that's really the, the overview that I wanted to give, and, and please don't feel slighted if I didn't talk about your campaign or your issue, because everything you're doing is fantastic, and Peace Action supports all of it. And I'm just uh, humbled again and invigorated to be here and learn about all the fantastic work you're doing here. Climate change, because you, you, you sort of threw in a remark when you were talking about the triple you know, Martin Luther King thing, and you said climate change sort of fits in there. But, you know, in terms of movement, that is where the energy is going. And, and um, can you just say a bit more about how peace action fits into that? Well, it's been a challenge in that um, at the national level, and this is something, again, that I've known for a long time because of my experience, but your experience may be somewhat different, is at the national level, it's often harder to get intersectional solidarity and support between movements. Organizations and movements tend to be more siloed at the national level than they do at the state or local level. Now, it may still be difficult at the local level, but often you have more crossover because you have individuals that are labor activists and peace activists and environmental activists and racial justice activists, right? So even if you don't have institutional uh, buy-in, you're going to have interpersonal connections. And you know Joe, who's a union guy, he's also good on the environment and on peace and on racial justice issues, and you can call Joe and he'll mobilize people, right? So that's been my you know, experience for a long time. So if you look at the, the big people's climate marches, and Cole was one of the people that really pushed hard on this, and I know others did as well. Uh, the first couple people's climb, climate marches, we organized, and actually even going back farther than that, geez, during the Obama presidency, there was a big mobilization in DC where it was supposed to be bringing together a broad umbrella of movements, including climate and other things, and peace really wasn't supposed to be addressed. And yet, a lot of the speakers talked about peace, and a lot of them made the connection, particularly not just that the, the US is the biggest, the US military is the biggest polluter and consumer of fossil fuels, but also you know, just the colossal economic waste of resources that go to the military and to war instead of uh, restoring the climate, et cetera. Uh, but we, we persisted on that, and there were a couple times in the People's Climate Marches where we had a separate peace caucus or peace table or whatever, but it wasn't among the official demands or calls of the march, but then it, you know, we persisted on that and it did get in there. I mean, I still think it's, it's difficult because um, to me, and I would bet if you just pulled somebody off the street and they don't know anything about progressive activist movements or whatever, and ask them, do you think peace and environmental movements should be one and the same or should be joined? They would probably say, of course they should be. And yet if you talk to a lot of the environmental groups, they'd probably give you a lot of reasons why they aren't, why we aren't or haven't been over the years. Um, so I think it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing struggle. But 
What Joe's talking about next year at the NPT, this will be at least the third time of the every five year NPT review conferences where I think we've done a good job saying it's not just about the NPT. And you know, nuclear non-proliferation treaty review conference, I fall asleep even saying all those words. <laughs> Most people wouldn't even know what that is, right? And so taking something that's relatively arcane, even though it's very important, it's about the continued existence of life on Earth if we don't get rid of nuclear weapons, right? But the NPT has become almost a complete dead end in terms of moving towards with nuclear disarmament, which is why we have 123 countries that decided they needed to have a treaty for the uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons. But this is the third time that we've explicitly broadened our, our organizing around the NPT to include not just peace and disarmament, but racial and social justice and climate. And I think it'll be even stronger this time than it has been the previous two. So if you go you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, so it's at least the third uh, where we've tried to make that a major threat. So it's one of the ways we've been doing that. If I could just add, we're, we're, we've invited Bill McKibben to speak, we're hoping to get his, 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 his sign on. Uh, and just, interestingly, uh, it, so at some point in April, uh, 350.org is planning a major investment campaign focused on the two biggest investors in, 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 in climate, in, in fossil fuels rather, uh, Chase uh, and Citibank. Uh, and they'll be, uh, we want to try to find ways in which we can you know, kind of in, integrate our movements. Also, just to say is we've hired a, a kind of New York area organizer for this mobilization, Aziz Tehan. He actually comes out of the climate change movement. Uh, and we we're hoping through him we can make some of these connections a bit more, and, a bit more deeply. And McKibben himself is somebody who hasn't talked about war and peace for a long time, but he's starting to more and more, yeah. and starting to help make those connections. And I think you know, leaders who speak out on these issues can make a difference when they help to connect them. Peter's next. In the nuclear disarmament discussion, Willem de Klerk, uh, the former mm -hmm. president of uh, South Africa, and who, yes, with Nelson Mandela, did away with apartheid, but who before that did away with South Africa's nuclear weapons program. Um, he's very ardent, and he said something that just is going to stick with me forever. He said, we must arouse the people. And he was very emphatic about it. He didn't have anything to slap his hand on, but he would have if he could have. So I'm, if we think of it that way, arousing the people, are we doing enough? Clearly we're not doing enough. So <laughs> I think that's why we're here. <laughs> and you know that uh, it's not good enough cutting off the stems, you've got to get the roots, right? And uh, one of the deepest roots of war is the wars of business, right? And nobody knows that our tax dollars are financing these super profits of these corporations that left the department. Now, here in Massachusetts, Kevin mentioned that we have this, as you all know, we have this divestment bill. Uh, the divestment bill. We have two divestment bills, one from Raytheon. Saudi Arabia, the second one from manufacturers, um, you know, that's to the pension fund of the best. So we'll come back to it more in the second discussion. But please, when you, you're getting many requests to come to the State House and testify, I'm one of the ones sending them out on other bills. But that bill is really uh, potentially politically significant. And it's such a hot potato that it might actually get noticed. Jonathan, this is for to, for the state to divest? For the whole state of Massachusetts. That's terrific. What's the date of the hearing? We're going to talk about it's, this all day. It's probably November 18th. It hasn't been confirmed, but that's the likely date. It's a Monday. Uh, Linda. I, if you recall, uh, A.J. Musty was one of the leading pastors for the anti-war movement. And he said anti-war people always run into a problem with the domestic movements like immigration, we see with the 350.org, uh, civil rights movements, because they feel that if they take on the issue of war, like Martin Luther King did, that they're going to compromise their goals working with what they consider to be the liberals or the Democratic Party. And I think that's a phenomenon we're all familiar with. And it's, it's, uh, it's our main problem, to me. This is what I see. 
again and again and again. And it was true with the big planet march. There was not a goal of ending war. The women's march didn't include war. Women, women who have historically been the most anti-war, didn't even include that in the big women's march. So my feeling lately has been we have to go to them, number one. But secondly, I'm very interested to see this national conference that's being called. You said there's a difference between an anti-war movement and a peace movement. I'm wondering what you think we're in now. Do you feel that a big unified national conference would help our, our entire united situation? So the two things you just asked, uh, the second one. Um, I think one of the challenges is, is you really have two hurdles in building sort of broader um, progressive coalitions or movements or, or even just solidarity. Um, and so the first is, is somewhat analytical. And one of the things that Jonathan was just saying about war being big business, um, that, that is a difficult thing for people to grasp. And also, uh, speaking earlier about uh, people in this country just sort of being in denial about our level of militarism, uh, that's asking a lot for um, folks who are most focused on the environment. Even if you present them with solid information that war and preparations for war is the biggest despoiler of the planet. And the United States military is the biggest polluter and, and consumer of fossil fuels. So there, there is that analytical um, hurdle. But then there's the organizing hurdle. And I think the organizing hurdle is actually harder because let's say all of a sudden, you, you did a lot of work, and you got a lot of the mainstream environmental groups to uh, support you in terms of, of anti-war or, or peace or disarmament organizing. What's the vehicle where they can really make a difference? I think the Green New Deal is a good one. I think the Green New Deal is a good vehicle, a good handle or lever that you can pull. Because if you have analytical kismet or, or solidarity or whatever, that's one thing and that's difficult enough. But then how do you organize around something that makes change and makes it different? Especially that um, people who say, I agree with you now, please tell me what to do. And is it this bill or is it this, uh, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I do think that's a challenge and you have to look at vehicles that, that actually do help you move. And I think Green New Deal can be one of those. And I think it's also good where you see uh, some of the divestment uh, efforts that do bring together both climate change and weapons. So without going into a long story, uh, so I live in Maryland just outside of Washington and for a while I lived in Tacoma Park which people jokingly call the People's Republic of Tacoma Park and it has one of the most, one of the strongest and long-standing um, nuclear weapons free zone ordinances and I was on the committee, the nuclear weapons free zone committee and we have standing as an actual advisory committee to the mayor and the city council. When we put forward, at first it was just around uh, um, don't bank on the bomb, you know, the list of all the nuclear weapons producers and let's get the city's money out of that. Uh, this was several years ago and we got unanimous support from the mayor and the city council. This was at least three years ago. They have not divested one nickel yet. Really? And I understand that's the same in Cambridge, right? They, yeah, yeah. They've they supported it, but they haven't they done really squat douche. Do yeah. yeah. They say, oh, the state has tied our hands. We can't yeah. do a thing. So. Right. So, there's all, and so if you can't get the People's Republic of Tacoma Park to actually divest a nickel, and there, there are reasons, and we've tried to work through them, but um, you know, it is very challenging. But one of the things that we did then is we had taken the leadership, but then there's environmental committees as well, and now they've jumped on board, and so we want to do it as a joint thing, so that the divestment would be both from fossil fuels and other despoilers of the environment and the weapons corporations. So again, that's a lever where you are concretely, not just making the analytical connection, but the organizing and the shoe leather and the cell phone minutes connection, and you're pulling a lever together, right, that benefits the greater common good. Um, in terms of the peace or anti-war movement, uh, to me it's, a, it's just a matter of, you know, how many bodies you got, how much money you got, how much resources you got, how many allies you got, how many coalitions you got, right? And it's either yay or, or here, right? All right. And during 
Vietnam, during Central America, Solidarity Movement, during Iraq War, we were here. And we're seldom there. We're more likely here. And that's just the way it is. And people talk about, well, we don't really determine the timing of movements. Movements happen for reasons that are often you know, beyond our capacity to create. And I don't think you can create uh, a large anti-war movement if there isn't a perception that it's an important problem. And it's just not the same. Like, uh, it's, it's <laughs> heinous to me that uh, the, the drone wars and what we're doing supporting Yemen and, or support, sorry, supporting Saudi Arabia and the horrible slaughter in Yemen. But it just is objectively not the same as the Iraq War, the Vietnam War, in terms of people's understanding and perception. There are not as many people being killed. To me, one person being killed is one too many. But you can't beat people over the head and say, why can't you mobilize the same way you did around Yemen or around drones or around Syria or whatever? Why can't you mobilize the same way you did around Iraq or Vietnam? It just it doesn't happen. So it's a, it's a challenge for us. We always want to be making those connections and educating people. But you can't force people to put down their lives, which is what a lot of people did, and even the, the Iraq War. And to me, it's the second iteration of the Iraq War. Really, the Iraq War started in 1990, 91, and then the period of the sanctions during Clinton has been going on forever. Um, you know, a lot of people I know put down their lives and, and made that their priority, but now a lot of them have gone back to whatever they were doing before, and you can't blame them. That's what people do. When we talk about sort of convincing uh, the climate justice people that our uh, cause is theirs, it seems to me we need to reverse that. And that is that you can't be a nuclear disarmament advocate if you are not also a climate justice mm -hmm. advocate. Yeah. And that we need to join them, we need to be with them if we have any hope of getting them to adopt or, or, or understand that nuclear disarmament at least is uh, essentially uh, is an essential part of the climate justice uh, movement. I might say it's, it's uh, of equal uh, importance. Can so I, it's can not I that's question the question. That? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I don't disagree with you conceptually, but there is the reality of the resource imbalance. So the environmental groups or climate change groups, just in terms of their resources, are here and the peace folks are here. That's just the reality in terms of resources and supporters, members, etc. They're not dumb people. They must understand the connection, but they choose not to work on peace issues for the most part. How are you going to change their mind? Well, uh, I don't have any thought about how you reverse those that resource differential. I'm saying that really what we need to do is become active in the climate justice uh, movement if we have any hope of having a dialogue uh, with them. That's really sort okay. of my point in my, it's a little bit, it's a question. Um, we've been working on that and um, so to me it's illogical to think that you can uh, solve the climate, and I'll use the word catastrophe, because I think that's the right word. Look what's going on in California right now. Um, I think human beings are resilient, but I think our social structures are extremely rickety. Um, politically, economically, socially, our, our structures are really rickety, like knock it over with a feather. I mean, capitalism could go like that next week from factors that I don't pretend to be able to predict. Um, and so I do think that the commonality is the existential threat to life on Earth, right? Between nuclear weapons and between climate change. And that's where the differential between peace and nuclear disarmament could be discerned, right? That even if you're not you don't think peace is possible, you understand that nuclear weapons are an existential threat, not just to humanity, but to all life on Earth, right? So um, the problem is there are insidious uh, tentacles, not just of the war machine, but of big corporations, that um, a lot of people just don't question. And again, it does get back to the triple evils of the giant triplets. So I don't want to be too specific, but a dear friend of mine worked for a long time raising money for a very well-funded institution 
and she found out that their new facility was going to be partially funded and maybe even name on the building um, by either Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or maybe both. She resigned in protest because she said, I can't do this. And again, without telling you the, too many of the details, because not a lot of this is public, the facility, the organization she worked for, specifically helped children. And her point to her bosses was, aren't the lives of Yemeni children who are killed by Raytheon and Lockheed Martin's bombs, aren't their lives as important as the children we help here in the United States? And what she got was like blank stares. <laughs> So those tentacles, not just of the war machine, in this case it's the war machine, but of ExxonMobil and you know, whoever, uh, I mean, some of, the, some of the big environmental groups probably wouldn't divest their holdings <laughs> from Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. I don't know that for sure, but a lot of them may say, why, why should we? So, so I do think those are some of the realities that you have to uncover and educate, and some of that might be extremely frustrating, but um, those are the kind of things that... that do make sense in terms of making the connections analytically, but then also, again, what are the levers we can pull that move us all forward, which I think is a great transition to talking about the fantastic work you guys are doing at the State House. It really is impressive. I'm not aware of any other state. I mean, I think there's some great stuff going on locally around divestment and around, uh, you know, back from the brink resolutions and all that, but in terms of the real comprehensive program that you guys have been working on at the, at the state legislature, I don't think anyone else in the country is doing that. Um, so maybe it's a good transition into